You are on the Frenzy Feed. The, the Professor, Professor Frenzy, Frenzy Show! Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Professor Frenzy, it's a show. Professor Frenzy Show. Hello, and welcome to the Professor Frenzy Show, episode 295. My name is Jerry. And I'm Chris. And we are your hosts. On the Professor Frenzy Show, we are going to try to spotlight some smaller publishers' comics that we think deserve some attention. We aren't going to write or score comics. We aren't really even going to be reviewing comics. We're just going to talk about some that we think people should consider reading. So, Chris, did you read any good comics this week? Well, yes, Professor. As a matter of fact, I did. Professor, I'm really looking forward to our show. We, I think we've got uh, several mutual reads, and we yeah. both looked at two books apiece that the other one didn't look at. So let's dive right in. We looked at Phantom Road, number nine from Image Comics, written by Jeff mm -hmm. Lemire. Art done by Gabriel Hernandez, Walta, and it's three ninety nine. Professor, can you bring myself and the listeners up to speed about what happens here? You betcha. So the FBI agent Teresa chases the Hawaiian shirt guy through the truck stop to get information about all the weirdness. But she can't get him because he disappears. Dom and Birdie take a look at the weird little creature that hatched from the egg that they were carrying. And when they touch it, they each get visions. Birdie sees what happens to Dom's son when Dom was working on the truck and his son wanted to help and got run over by the truck while he was uh, working on it and killed. Now, Dom sees that Birdie was, when she was young, was molested by a priest when she was in, I guess, foster care. Having seen this about the, each other, they definitely form a deeper bond. But an attack team enters their hotel room. Can the little egg guy help them out? Hmm, yeah, he does, and it's pretty wicked. Um, this is funny. Phantom Road is a funny book for me. Whenever it comes up on the list, it's like, oh, yeah, I see it, Phantom Road. I read that. I don't get excited for it. I don't, uh, you know, like really look forward to it and everything. But every time I read it, I get further and further brought into the world. And it isn't the monsters in this world. For me, it's the journey, the relationship journey, really, of Dom and Birdie as they get to know each other. And that's the book for me. And as far as I'm concerned, the more Dom and Birdie right now, the better. So I'm going to give this one an A+. Plus. Chris, what did you think of Phantom Road number nine? Well, thanks, Prof. What impressed me the most about this title was how fast of a read this was. Hands down, this was the fastest read out of all the books I had this week. And that's not necessarily a negative because one of yeah. the things happened in this book that I wished for was the story to, and narrative to progress a little bit. It did. And it also gave us some more character depth with our central characters, Dom and Birdie. And I really, really applaud that and how well it was executed. Mm -hmm. Both of us... Both of the central characters got to see a flashback of something from the others. And I really like that re reveal. And there was this really great shared consciousness experience. And I say great in the sense that they accomplished it, not necessarily for the events that were depicted. I want to be, yeah. be clear upon yeah. that. I like that we have this artwork that is sort of like in this bright neon green with the white and the hues mm. portrayed there. I thought that was really, really effectively done and i have to applaud the creative team for that i also like that we also got a little bit of agent weaver and not a lot but just to include her with respect to the narrative she sees the hawaiian shirted guy she knows he's there he he disappears vanishes mysteriously but i really like that at least this book gave us a taste of all of our central characters it just didn't neglect them and i didn't want this to be more top heavy on one sort of group versus the other I had been clamoring for something to happen this book, and I had to be careful what I wish for because it happened here. We got a lot of events. We've got also the these uh, secret op agents closing in on Diamond Birdie at the hotel room, and then all of a sudden, spoiler alert, uh, heads start popping here. Something is really, mm -hmm. really going on here. And I really like the way Lemire sort of... Uh, is winding this storyline like a pendulum. It's slowing down, but now it's ramping back up as we're getting to mm -hmm. the center. And I, I really applaud them for kind of speeding up the narrative a little bit to keep me really, really engrossed. And I, I read this twice, and I think it took me less than two minutes both times when I read it, just to make sure I had a handle on it before we did the recording here. I, I really thought this was effective storytelling because it conveyed so much in, in just a fast amount of time for me as a reader and i thought that was really really effectively done just just a personal aside with that one too 
Yeah, this I agree with your comment. This it was a very quick read. In fact, I was done with it before I even kind of realized that I was just page turning. Um, a lot of it, a lot of the story is told through the pictures, which is exactly the right way to do a comic book. And I think, you know, Lemaire is he's so good at this. <laughs> um, his skill, it, it almost seems like of course this is a good book. Of course this is how it would work out because he's just so expert and just lays it out right. Um, I, I just dig this book quite a bit. Yeah, one other last thing I had in my notes, Prof, too, was I really like the little baby entity alien yeah. thingy from its <laughs> shell. And it's it's not necessarily scared. It's not necessarily afraid, but it's, it's you could, I, I like that we don't know what it's saying, but yet it gives us, the writing gives us a question mark after each sentence. So that you could also tell what, this is telling us that this character is also asking what's going on in its own way yeah. of communicating too. So I thought that was really effectively done from the writing standpoint as well. And I just can't wait to see where, where this goes from here. Me too. I would watch a book of um, Dom and Bertie just doing about anything, going going to Costco. And I concur. <laughs> Our thoughts and impressions <laughs> on Phantom Road number nine from Image Comics. It's priced at three ninety nine, and this book for mature eighteen plus. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Moving right along, we both looked at Conan the Barbarian number eight from Titan Comics, written by Jim Zub, art done by Doug Braithwaite. It's priced at three ninety nine. Uh oh, Professor Conan's mm -hmm. been possessed. What uh -oh. happens here? Yeah, Conan's been possessed by, I think they said, three spirits, and he's killing people en route to finding an ancient Pictish sword. He follows the trail of the sword, you know, like he he says, oh, I know where, where it was, so I'm going to talk to that guy. And he says, oh, I gave it to this other guy, you know, after he gets tortured. And then Conan goes to the other guy, and they said, oh, I gave it to the other guy. So he's going around finding this sword, killing people and torturing them and stuff. And he finally is led to the Museum of Relics, where the sword is guarded. And he's able to fight off some guards and gets his hand on the sword. And he has a vision of a beautiful woman who apparently calls him to do something I certainly did not expect. I know my notes are a little light on this one. I did. I, I love Conan. I like the story. I like where this this um, this arc is going and where this book is going, but I did find this issue to be a little scattered and unfocused. There was some back and forth between possessed Conan and the subconscious Conan, and I found that a little confusing and a little frustrating. There were clues, pretty pretty vivid clues, you know, in colors as to where you were, but still, it was a little a bit of a head scratcher. I love a good Conan book, and this is definitely a good Conan book, but this issue is maybe not my favorite. Chris, what do you think about Conan the Barbarian, Volume 5, Number 8? Yeah, thanks, Professor. I'm kind of with you. Uh, for me, I concur with your points, but I'm coming at it from a different angle because I think from the previous issue, I was led to believe that Thulsa Doom was sort of like the puppet master of Conan, and mm -hmm. he would have somewhat more of a prominent role here. There was no there's no spoiler per se if we, we know that going into this issue, but yeah. he, he's still an unseen entity, and we don't know really the mechanizations of why he's doing what he's doing uh, of all the weapons that conan must have wielded why does he need this particular small pickish sword that that has some type of fondness is it magical i don't know is it something that uh, if there's a, some some sort of symbolism here it's sort of lost on me i i liked the ride itself because we have this introspection with conan and and it's the storytelling itself with with zub giving us all these uh, picturesque words with respect to this was really, really well done. I applaud that. But I just don't know what the quest is. It ended on a cliffhanger, and Professor, I applaud you for not necessarily spoil it, spoiling it, because I'm sure I probably would have. <laughs> but this did take a, a twistedly dark turn that I didn't see coming, and I just wonder where we're going to go from here. Mm -hmm. And where why isn't Thosal Room actually revealed himself? I, I don't yeah. know. Perhaps there's some bit of Conan lore with respect to the timeline that I'm not aware of. And if I will concede that. Uh, I thought the artwork was gorgeous, and I thought elements of the storytelling were really won wonderfully said and written. But like you, I was kind of lost in some places, but I am still digging this title. Excellent. Me too. Our thoughts and impressions on Conan the Barbarian, number eight from Titan Comics. It's three ninety nine, and it is a book for mature readers. And if you thought we were done talking about Conan, <laughs> have I got some news for you? I have a feeling we both enjoyed the next one we're talking. We're going to talk about it's Savage Sword of Conan. Now this is volume two, number one from Titan Comics, and this is six ninety nine. Professor, 
We've got the creative team on the main Conan story of uh, Jarnar Kuti and Max van Fafner. It's six ninety nine, but we have a much, 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 much higher page count yes. than you would think for even a couple of uh, comic books. Professor, I think we've got a lot to talk about <laughs> on this one. I can't wait. I will let you take the floor first. Yeah, I'm going to kind of stick to the main story here because there's a lot. This is a, you know, this is a, like a seven buck book. But it's a huge value for your money. Um, it's more than twice uh, the length of a regular comic and magazine sized. So I am super excited to have Savage Sword of Conan back, uh, having two good Conan books back in my reading list, which hasn't happened since uh, the 70s. So super happy about that. Um, the main story is, so Conan is a general in the army of Prince Zahid. Sahid wants to take the city that his brother rules, and it's positioned over a gold mine. So he wants to be the ruler, and everyone else can have the gold. The army can split the gold. Cool. Also in the army is an expert in war engines named Enea, and she's an expert in, like, trebuchets and stuff. Now, there's a lot of drama with Zahid's men. Uh, Conan has sex with Enea. There's a lot of guys, uh, soldiers kind of abandon the army, and it seems fine. But it turns out, that the city is undergoing a plague. And who cares if everybody, uh, you know, if the army is leaving, it's not going to take many people to take the city. Uh, so they do. They're able to get into the city. And it turns out that, you know, most people are dead. And also they find out that the gold mine is exhausted. So it turns out that uh, Zahid didn't care about the gold or ruling the city. Zahid just wanted his love, Shirin, back. But she is sick and dying. And she says, leave me, leave me with Fahid. And it turns out that Zahid is just a jerk to her at the end. He, She says the name of his brother, who he presumably hates and hates that he has her, and Zahid slaps his great love, who he just came to save, and calls her a whore. Nice. Nice. He's a really great guy. Um, now, of course, he promised the gold to the army, and there isn't any. But down there where the gold should be, there's a nest full of dinosaurs instead. Can Conan and Enea defeat them and escape the city? So I love this book. It's um, black and white. Uh, there's no color in this one. And that's just, you know, savage sortie. And I love having it back. I thought it was I thought it really was weird about Zahid's uh, behavior to his love. But I think it just showed that he's an idiot and uh, deserving of everybody hating him and Conan screwing with him. Uh, so that's what I think about this story. Chris, what did you think about Savage Sword of Conan, volume two, number one? Thanks, Prof. I, overall, uh, I'll come to the contents in a moment, but it, for let me just applaud Titan for putting this out in the format that it did and just deciding to run with it because I couldn't help but get the nostalgia feels for me just to look at this. Uh, there were a lot of quote comic magazines, I would say, on magazine racks, early 70s. I remember stuff from Warren, you know, with the spirit and the creepy and the eerie. And then uh, Marvel had their own set of magazines. And for me, it was sort of catch as catch can back in the day due to my limited comic budget and mm -hmm. this being for a slightly older audience than I was at the time. So this wasn't for me. And by the time I discovered them, it was sort of like I, I missed the boat a little bit, mm -hmm. you know, and getting these titles from back in the day, be it Howard the Duck from Marvel or the Hulk magazine or any of the uh, sci-fi or horror that was put out by Marvel or Warren uh, was you know, out of my price range or or just something that uh, didn't have access to at my uh, local 7-Eleven or comic shop. You know, it was sort of, like I said, you know, sometimes I, I'd acquire this either at a show or a con or seeing it there. And then uh, when I read it, though, I was just mesmerized by what the medium could do for in regards to storytelling and regards to artwork aimed at a slightly older audience than I was at the time. And I thought, wow, this is fascinating. This is mind bending. I mean, there are so many ways you can go with telling stories of uh, sword and sorcery and fantasy and science fiction that was a whole new world that I, I had limited exposure to. So hopefully when somebody gets to see this, they can get in on the ground floor of something 
that has nostalgic feels for an older reader, but could still have, I hope, some appeal to a younger reader discovering mm -hmm. some sword and sorcery for the first time. Yeah. Okay, that's off on my tangent, but wow, this was really, really good stuff. Uh, it had everything that I expected from a slightly longer Conan story. It, there was a quest, there was violence, there was treachery, there were giant monsters, there were total surprises, there was deception, there was more violence, there was beheading, there was bloodletting, <laughs> and ultimately there was a tale of revenge with a, with a weapon that I should have seen uh, used that I really missed on the foreshadowing of, but I really, really applaud the story. Uh, it was well crafted. Our characters spoke in voices. These were people that you kind of knew, and they were given slightly a little bit more than two dimensions that you know they were entitled to. Uh, did I say I like the format? I love the format. I was a little bit worried that the black and white art wouldn't really give us the vividness of the colors, but I really mm -hmm. thought the black and white artwork worked here in this particular medium with particular shades and particular things. I didn't necessarily have to see the. Uh, blood splattering and it's, it's uh, in the redness of it. You know, I didn't, I didn't necessarily <laughs> miss it. It was fine with the way it worked. And I really, really applaud the creative team for just the format itself, because we had some nice pinups here. We got a map of the Hiberian age. we got some nice text pieces with respect to Conan. There was also a nice uh, story of Solomon Kane written by yeah, Patch right. Zerzer. And that again, gave me the nostalgia feels from like uh, the, the, the seventies Marvel with respect to that. So I applaud everybody here. We also had a nice introduction from Roy Thomas, who was, you know, certainly had a hand in bringing Conan into the comic book medium. How cool was that? You know, just to acknowledge, you know, the, the grandfather who ushered in Conan to the comic books, having a, uh, having a hand with respect to this. And we had some nice pinups with Conan and Belit and everything there. A nice one with Solomon Cain by Howard Chaikin. Ah, I, I hope a new reader can appreciate the, some of the, the talent <laughs> and the names behind this, because this was really, really a trip down memory lane with respect to... Uh, seeing Conan when, and some of these names attached to this medium here in the now and in this decade and in this year. Oh, loved it. Loved the story, loved the format. And I liked that we got another Conan book in this element. And it, I won't necessarily, I think it's a little too unfair to compare the comic to the magazine. It gives us a great character that we both know and are familiar with. And it just gives us a different format and a way to tell the stories. And I, for that, I appreciate it. Read of the week, hands down. And I thought it was a bargain at the price point as well. This was a great, 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 great comic slash magazine. Yeah, I agree. I'm super glad to have this back and uh, can't wait for more. Yeah, Professor, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. You're slightly older than I am. Were Were you into the magazines as much? Did you, Were they accessible to you? Did you have any interest in them back in the uh, day or just tough to come across in your ballywick when you were growing up? Yeah, I was able to get uh, get some Conan stuff. Um, you know me, I like color, so I would generally stay away from the black and white stuff, even though I would pick it up sometime, but I wasn't like obsessive. Like mm, mm. I got, yeah, I read, um, Barbarian and Conan the King, I think, uh, and Savage Sword. I think there was a, there was a lot of titles back in the day. <laughs> yes, there were. Oh yeah. But I liked it. I liked the differences. I, I'm not a uh, person that says, ah, this is my one, like Batman. You know, if if I was a, uh, you know, I uh, really focused on it, like uh, Adam West is my Batman, period. You know, I don't mind different Batmans. I don't mind different takes on it, you know, um, and like Conan's, I don't mind different takes on the character. Um, but uh, there was a lot back in the day. I don't I can't really keep them all straight from. 40 years ago. Yes. Once upon a time, there was a yeah. wide range of things on the magazine <laughs> rag that there certainly aren't there now. You know, with respect right. to this. So those were our thoughts and impressions on the Savage Sword of Conan. This was the first issue. It's from Titan Comics. Higher page count, yeah. $6.99, suggested for mature readers. Worth it. Absolutely. And our final mutual read is Nasty, number seven from Vault Comics, written by John Lees, art done by... Adam Cahoon, and it's four ninety nine. Professor, I think we're at the penultimate issue. Mm. What happens here? Well, Cynthia Cargill is giving a speech to protest the Halloween horror fest that Thumper and his friends are putting on, and they're also making a movie for. 
Red Ennis, Thumper's childhood imaginary serial killer friend, has come to life, and he's now gone wild and very dangerous. But Thumper's all bugged out about the movie situation and is kind of checked out of the project to, to hunt for Red Ennis, basically. Uh, Mira, his best friend, is trying to get the project back on track, and she goes to Thumper's house and sees the Red Ennis videotape and plays it. Red Ennis appears and attacks her. Thumper arrives before Red Ennis is about to kill her and tells him to put her down. He burns the videotape, which releases the evil spirit, and Thumper confronts Ennis, who undergoes a curious transformation. I don't want to spoil it, but it, this does make a lot of sense to me. Uh, now they have to finish making the movie somehow and show it in the final issue next month. Uh, I found this issue to be a little slow moving. I wasn't sure as I was reading it if I was liking it as I was reading it, but I did like how the issue ended. The interaction between Thumper and Red Ennis and Mira really made sense to me and puts Thumper, I think, in a very strong place uh, for the final issue. I really dug, in the long run, I really dug the nasty number seven. What'd you think, Chris? Thanks, Prof. A lot of times when I talk about books, I describe by saying, did it have enough meat on the bone? And mm -hmm. one thing I certainly can't accuse Nasty of is not having enough meat on the bone. In fact, if anything, it might have too much meat on the bone because I think <laughs> a lot of times it's a little more wordy than it needs to be. It gives us a little more character development than I don't necessarily care about. It embellishes quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Almost... To a fault. Uh, I, I think I got the beats of all the characters down, but at this point, now that we're in the home stretch of the title, I'm just wondering how much I care and feel invested with it. Mm -hmm. I I think I know who our characters are, and I think with respect to the voices that were given with Cynthia, I, I, I think I've had enough of Cynthia at this point. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things that I didn't see, and Professor, I applaud you for just how you brilliantly, once again, describe the contents of the book without spoiling it is just the, what happens to Ren Ennis here. And looking out upon it and reflecting on it, I, I asked myself as a reader, do, do I need to see any more of the nasty? And I don't mean that in a negative sense. I think it told me a great story in as much as it needed to tell. Yeah. And if it did, if it didn't hear, I would have been perfectly content with that because mm -hmm. I don't, I don't necessarily think this has to go any further. Yeah. Um, that said, I, I just don't know what's going to happen the second issue beyond making the movie, and perhaps there'll be a surprise in store that I don't know about. One other question I ask myself internally, would this have possibly been better if it had given us a, like a giant size conclusion? Because mm. it wrapped up so many elements that I thought happened here. What more did this need to tell? If this is going to be, uh, the next issue is going to be like an overtold epilogue, if you will. I almost think... Mm, it could have possibly worked that way, but I just don't know what's what the contents are going to be in this next one. And I don't know what any surprises are going to be had. That said, I hope there are surprises. I hope I am wrong with respect to it having just a little bit more and having something that I don't expect happening in the next issue. Because I, I was fine with this almost ending here you know, mm -hmm. with, 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 with what we saw happen to Red Ennis and leaving it at that. Uh, I, I thought the character's have a feeling for horror movies that only a certain people can get and capture. And for that, I applaud it. If you like mm -hmm. horror movies, I think you can appreciate the characters here and their love of this genre. This has sort of been a love lever to a, a medium and stuff that goes back to a time where trying to find those old obscure horror movies were only in the VHS format and trying to track those down. And it, it, it brought some more nostalgia feels to me because when you sort of grow and find that there's a medium and a genre you fall in love with, it's like, Hey, I got to see this next hammer film. I know I got to watch all these hammer films. Well, how do I track them down? You know? And it's, mm. it's, it's the hunt, it's the chase to, to get their own thing. And, and just the love of this genre and to make their own thing as well mm -hmm. is really, really beautiful. And it should be applauded here. I like the nasty and it, it's given me a lot. And I, I just, I just don't know where, if it needs to end or how it will end at this <laughs> point, but here we are. Those are my thoughts and impressions. I think that's a great point. Never occurred to me that this could be the end because re really the point of this book isn't was never so much about the making this movie or um, the film festival. It was really Thumper, Red Ennis, and Mira. 
you know, their relationship and who Red Ennis is and how, you know, Thumper can deal with who Red Ennis is and everything like that. And you're absolutely right. That has been kind of resolved. This book could be over. But now we have to see the Cynthia Cargill stuff. And I just kind of feel like this is going to be an eight issue book. This could have been a five issue book. Um, I, I just don't think there's that much plot that we've covered in eight issues um, compared to another like eight issue book. So um, this could have been shorter. I like Thumper. I like the setup. I like the characters, particularly Thumper, Mira, and then Red Ennis. But uh, otherwise, you know, I, I think there's um, it's a little long. It's a little long. And that's what I'm thinking. Yep, I'm with you. Uh, shout out to Adam Cahoon with the artwork. Some really nice panel layout as well that you don't find in the conventional sense here. And for that, I like the creativity that you brought to that. Absolutely. And that's all I had. Very good. So, Chris, what other books do you read this week? <laughs> Thanks, Prof. Moving right along, I also looked at Duke number three from Image Comics, written by Joshua Williamson, art done by Tom Riley and Jody Belair, priced at $3.99 per the advance solicit. Duke's search for answers has led him to a classified holding site for America's most dangerous prisoners. Now, he's the most wanted man in the world. Unfortunately, everyone seems to prefer him dead over alive. End of quote in an advance solicit. In this one, Duke remains imprisoned in the pit, falsely accused of murder, while trying to get to the bottom of what he witnessed, a transformer, which remains classified information. In the cell next to him is the Baroness, and we get a brief origin retell of her, and she chides him for his loyalty to those who would imprison him. Now, since Duke is still alive and poses a threat, an unseen baddie enlists an op known as Major Bud to break into the pit and take Duke out. During the breakout, the Baroness implores Duke to set her free, which he does and gives her a weapon and hoping for no betrayal. During the ensuing chaos, Bud gets the drop on Duke and is about to kill him, but not before the Baroness shoots Bud in the head and wow. then points her weapon at Duke noting there is a huge bounty on his head to be continued. Wow. Per my notes, the fast pacing and straightforwardness read not too confusing of writing and storytelling makes Duke presently my second favorite title in images, Energon verse right behind transformers and just above void rivals. As previously stated, GI Joe and transformers were cartoon properties that were aimed at a audience younger than me when they first appeared, but I am certainly enjoying most of these titles, with this one in particular having a conspiracy bent. Those were my thoughts and impressions on Duke number three from Image Comics, priced at $3.99 and as a book rated for a teen audience. Great. And I also looked at Project Cryptid number six from Ahoy Comics. Uh, our writers here were Matt Boers and Maddie Lou Chansky, art done by Daniel Irizari and Maki Nero. It's priced at $3.99. Per the advanced solicit, Creatures on the Loose, writer Matt Boers and artist Daniel Irizari take us to Puerto Rico to discover the frightful chupacabra. Then Maddie Lou Chansky and Mary Neko take us in search of the perfect cryptid influencer. End of quote in advanced solicit. Okay. Our cryptids in this issue are the Chupacabra and Bigfoot. First up, a story entitled Cabron, written by Matt Boers and art done by Daniel Azari. Our story is narrated by Marisol, who works as a lackey in Puerto Rico for billionaire Kyson Ballard, who is working on experiments of rejuvenation of the human body, many of which include the intake of plasma and blood. In the bottom panel of page two of the story, we see a shipping container that Marisol has no idea what is kept inside. And as a reader, can immediately guess what is in that said container. There are local reports of sightings of a chupacabra and Marisol finds just that when she takes it upon herself to break into the shipping container and see it for herself. Ballard finds Marisol and she figures out that he is using the blood of the chupacabra in re the rejuvenating experiments, but he is exposed to the authorities and to the world at large via media. Marisol now enjoys a simple life with the chupacabra as a pet. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. And in the next story, Big Shoes to Fill, written by Matty Lubachansky and art done by Macinero, a social influencer named Kevlin goes to the backwoods and he tries to pick up his game with other influencers who are trying to get Bigfoot as part of their live media stream among heavy competition. 
Okay, Kevlin succeeds, albeit briefly, when a bigger and wealthier guy who runs a media empire captures Kevlin's Bigfoot. Oh, oh, oh. Okay. We also had some text pieces in here. We had uh, Serendipity Day by Carol Lay, drawn by Karen Lay, and we had The Egg Masses of On Autumn Redo, written by Robert Jasonic and are done by Shannon Wheeler. Up here my notes. I think by issue six of this particular title, I've come to realize <laughs> the challenge of this title is to make these fictional stories that involve cryptids as interesting as the actual purported accounts of the cryptids themselves. And that can be a tall order for a creator, and there have been varying results, in my opinion, with this title, with the cryptids having various roles and plot points to the stories themselves. I do like that this title gives us two comic book stories, but the caveat is where there is more opportunities to succeed, there can also be more opportunities to fail. I think this book somewhere lands somewhere in the middle for this particular issue. Those are my thoughts and impressions on Project Cryptid number six from Ahoy Comics, priced at $3.99, and it is a book rated for mature readers. Professor, mm -hmm. what other books did you look at this week? All right. First up, I read Ice Cream Man, number 38 from Image, written by W. Maxwell Prince, with art by Martin Morazzo and Chris o Halloran. That's $3.99. Welcome to Garyland. Now, Garyland looks very much like a walled-in prison, except all the residents or prisoners are named Gary with a number at the end, like Gary 38 and Gary 59, and they all look exactly alike. But they aren't clones. Oh, no, no, no. The doctors and whatnot tell them, no, you're not clones. Uh, you're individuals. Gary 59 was working over by the wall. His job was to do wall reinforcement, and he saw the world outside through a hole in the wall. Now, the Garys were always told that outside was chaos and dangerous, but Gary 59 didn't see chaos, just beauty. He tells the other Garys, uh, and Gary 38 doesn't believe him, but they get rid of Gary 59 quickly. And Gary 38 thinks, huh, there may be something up about that. Now, Gary 38's job is to rake leaves. Every morning, the yard is full of leaves. There's no trees around, but it's full of leaves. And then he rakes them and puts them away, and then boom. So Gary 38 can't forget what Gary 59 was talking about, about the outside, and he plans an escape. Go, Gary, go. This is a cool book and a really cool issue. I like this one. I really like the quick creation of this Garyland scenario. Prince is really good at creating a complete weird world with messed up rules <laughs> uh, really quickly in just a couple of pages. And it's so rich with internal logic, it feels kind of real. Now, Ice Cream Man is a collection of mostly one-shot stories, so he does this, like, this is the 38th time he's created a weird world. Um, this is a book that lives on the hair edge, so a lot of times it doesn't work. Most of the time it does, and sometimes it's excellent, and I think this one was, was really excellent. So that was Ice Cream Man number 38. And finally, I read Vampirous Carmilla Magazine 2025 Annual from Warrant Publishing Company. Various writers and artists, and this is $10.99. It's oversized even for a Vampirous Carmilla and magazine format. So this is a uh, magazine-sized black and white horror book in the style of eerie and creepy. And I've talked about all these stories before because this is a reprint and would be an excellent choice if you've heard me talk about Vampirous Carmilla. Thought, ah, maybe I'd like to read that and uh, get some of the best stories. Well, this annual has some of the best stories from the past four issues. You'll meet vampires, witchy sisters, cobra queens, silly scientists, and a dangerous butterface. It's all fun stuff. I've talked about this before, all these stories before. Definitely worth a read. So that's Vampirous Carmilla Magazine, 2025 Annual. So just a couple other we didn't get to. World Tree, 30, uh, World Tree number eight from Image, written by James Tynan IV and art by Fernando Blanco, and that's $3.99. And Rare Flavors number four from Boom Studios. I still need to do a catch-up on this. Written by Rom V with art by Felipe Andrade, and that's $4.99. And today is Wednesday. Even DC Wednesday, right? It's coming up. What books are you looking for this week, Chris? Thanks, Professor. We have Crave, number four from Image Comics, written and drawn by Maria Lovett. It's $3.99. Love Everlasting, number 13 from Image Comics, is out today, written by Tom King, art done by Elsa Chartier. It's $3.99. We also have The Last Mermaid, number one from Image Comics, written and drawn by Derek Kirk Kim. It's $3.99. 
Professor, there mm. also are another handful of books out today, aren't there? A small handful. Night People number one from Oni Press, written by Barry Gifford and Chris Condon, with art by Brian Level. That's four ninety nine. Void Rivals number seven from Image Comics, written by Robert Kirkman, with art by Lorenzo De Felici and Matthias Lopez, and that's three ninety nine. And Betty and Veronica Friends Forever Sleepover number one from Archie Comics, written and art by the great Dan Parent. What do you think about this week's books, Chris? Thanks, Professor. It's a light week. I'm going to be looking yeah. for Love Everlasting, and I just wonder what's going to happen there. Void Rivals, I, it's been so long since the previous issue, so hopefully it'll bring me up to speed. I think it starts a new story arc, so I'm intrigued with that one. Mm. Some of the new first issues, I will hope to look at to get some scans of some of the advanced stuff out there just to maybe get a preview if this is something I want to jump on board with. And we have an Archie one-shot, which only is credited to Dan Parent, which I love as an Archie uh, writer and drawer. But if the whole book is going to be by Dan Parent, this is going to be unusual because I'm wondering if this is going to contain uh, any reprint material is it going to be all original but it's maybe it's mm. all maybe it's half and half of original <laughs> and reprint with Dan Parent I don't know so I'm, I am intrigued with that Professor what are your thoughts and impressions well obviously Love Everlasting is the big one for me um, definitely we had a kind of a change we've been having a change in this book recently and uh, i can't wait to see where it continues crave I'll definitely get and I'll like it and uh, but I don't necessarily I, I wouldn't say I read crave i kind of absorb crave it's just a vibe and uh based on that's might be all i get i'll probably pick up betty and veronica because of damn parent um see i'll see how that looks but uh, i'll check that out but i think uh next week's comic section is going to be a pretty light show and now that's what's coming out today but now let's go back to the past for a great classic comic book. It's time for Chris's Comics Corner. Chris's Comics Corner. So, Chris, what classic comic book are you going to look at today? With apologies to Mac Rocks, <laughs> I'm going to bypass looking at an issue of Amazing Spider-Man just for now. I'll get back to it in a moment. But I also want to look at some issues of Marvel Team-Up as well at some point. But for now, with Easter season on the way, in a book that had a lot of symbolism with respect to Jesus Christ that I thought was really unusual as a kid when I first looked at it, I'm going to look at Green Lantern number 89, cover dated. April 1972, the story entitled And Through Him Save a World, written by Denny O'Neill and art done by Neil Adams. Our story opens with Oliver Queen being amused by an item that he reads in a paper where there's a little bit of vandalism going on in the city of Abraham where Carol Ferris Aircraft has an office. It seems that someone went into the office, posed as a painter, and decided to paint the office lobby. Then he leaves. But the receptionist noticed a funny smell, sort of like rotten eggs. So she alerted her boss, who examined what the paint was, and it turns out to be, after some testing, that it was industrial waste and sewer refuse that was on the property. Green Lantern enters, and he is not amused by this, but Green Arrow, Ollie says, Man, brother, you can make an average wet blanket look like a dessert. You know, you're just mad that he hits your girlfriend's place of uh, business there. But I really dig what this Isaac guy's doing. Well, they settle their hash and figure it out, but Green Lantern says, Hey, Ollie, I was actually here to ask if you wanted to go to the city of Abraham where your friend Isaac operates because I want to visit Carol. And Ollie accepts. Once they arrive, Ollie decides to walk around the grounds of Ferris Aircraft and he does some target shooting with his arrow. Before long, though, he's confronted by a guard of Ferris Aircraft. The guard doesn't believe that Ollie's there as a guest and he sticks a uh, giant German shepherd on him. Oliver Queen takes out the dog, but doesn't kill it. He also punches out the guard. But he does say, hey, I did tell you that I was here as a guest of Ferris Aircraft. The guard reluctantly agrees with Ollie, and he takes off. Soon after, Ollie senses a stranger nearby, and it turns out that it is Isaac himself. Meanwhile, back at Ferris Aircraft, Carol is giving Green Lantern a tour of the plant when all of a sudden some loose machinery and a drainage rig is starting to collapse. Green Lantern quickly uses his power ring to quash the threat. And he wonders that they've never had an accident like that before, and Green Lantern deduces it wasn't an accident. There were trenches dug around the rig, and they wonder if it could possibly be a deliberate action and if it was actually caused by Isaac. 
Meanwhile, Green Lantern and Isaac start to bond. Green uh, <laughs> Isaac patches up a wound that Green Lantern had along with the confrontation of the cop. And he finds out that, that Isaac is not too healthy. He's got a very, very severe lung issue, which was aggravated and as exacerbated by some of the industrial pollution that he's a part of. So he decides that he is striking back at these corporations. And through this, he's going to make a point. And Ollie digs what Isaac is standing for. So they find a bond ship and they decide, you know what, Isaac, if that's your cause, I am going to join you with that. And so they decide they're going to be a team. Well, Green Lantern flies in and he says, hey, uh, Isaac, were you the guy who deliberately did this thing with the uh, rig back there? Isaac says, well, you know, I might have done that, but I didn't mean any harm, but I did harm the machines. I, I don't want to harm any living creatures. Well, Green Lantern says, did it ever occur to you that some of the living creatures might suffer as a result of what you did? And Isaac says, well, I didn't think about that. Green Arrow counters and says, hey, you, you're missing what Isaac is standing for, but... Green Lantern says, well, that may well be, but he did commit a crime and he will have to go and answer for it. So with that, he uses his power ring to create a set of handcuffs, which he cuffs around Isaac. Uh, Ollie does not take that too well. So he shoots a sleeping gas arrow at a tree and it emits a gas that knocks out Green Lantern. And since he has no willpower while he's conscious, Isaac's handcuffs evaporate. But then... Isaac turns on Green Arrow because he's disgusted that he actually used a gas, a toxic, a pollutant in his own way. He's just a, a hypocrite. So with that, Isaac runs off and Green Arrow is disgusted by himself. Once again, Green Arrow is confronted by some guards. And after a confrontation, the three guards manage to knock out Green Arrow. Just at that point, Green Lantern revives and he is knocked unconscious as well. With that, though... They go back to Eris Faircraft Fair Quarters and they find out that Isaac has tied himself to a wing of a plane and he's propped up by a giant bar, a scene of Jesus on a crucifix, if you will. So the guards are wondering, why are you doing this? And he says, does it matter? I'm protesting here of what you're doing. You've got these pollution. You're killing people. It's so toxic what you're doing. I have to do this and continue until you're aware, until you stop doing this. More and more people gather there, and one of the local bosses appears, and he's named by Mr. Tyrone. And he says, hey, uh, Tyrone, what are you going to do about this? And at that point, Green Arrow and Green Lantern revive, only to be knocked unconscious again, and they're propped up along the wings of the plane. With this and a move similar to Pontius Pilate, Tyrone says, you can do anything you want. Let them protest. Let them stay up there for all I care. I'm washing my hands on the whole matter. Wow. Green Arrow revives and he shouts out to Isaac, who's tied to the plane. Hey, Isaac, how long can you hold out? He says, I don't know, but my lungs are collapsing. I'm weakening. I'm going to die at any moment here. Green Arrow shouts for Green Lantern to use his ring. He says it's no good. Some of the guards have taken away. Well, Green Arrow decides he has to do something. With his wrist chained, he presses against them for minutes, then for hours, until blood evaporates from his wrist and then he escapes. However, it's too late. Isaac looks up to the heavens, then he collapses his head, and just then a duff lives over and Isaac is dead. Well, presently at sunbreak, <laughs> Carol comes and she says, oh, Green Lantern, the security force got drunk. We found your power ring. Everything will be okay. He, the, our, the group confessed and they are, oh, so terribly sorry. All Green Lantern cares about is that Isaac is dead. Isaac died as the sun was rising. But Carol and another lackey say, well, maybe he was kind of crazy. And then Carol says, yeah, he was mad, but there was a sense of nobility that I can even aspire to. I suppose progress must always claim victims. With that, in a moment that brings down the house to me as a little kid, Green Lantern scowls. And with one turn, he takes his power ring and demolishes an airplane. And then the co-worker says, hey, what's the idea? That was a $9 million aircraft. And disgustedly, Green Lantern says, send me a bill. Wow. As a kid reading this story, I cannot convey how much emotional weight and impact this had to me as a kid. This was a story that dealt with ecology, and I had no idea all along that this particular run of Green Lantern was exploring social consciousness issues such as overpopulation and drug use. Even that a comic went one way just with, with this one issue when the religious symbolism as Isaac being drawn as Jesus Christ 
blew me away. And I just was so dumbfounded as a kid. I, I just couldn't put it into words that this medium had such storytelling where you didn't have costume villains running around like the Joker, but you had even corporations themselves being the quote unquote bad guy here and Green Lantern's girlfriend even being a part of it with respect to that. Wow. It this I cannot understand how much emotional weight and resonance has this to me, not just with the writing, but with Adam's artwork as well. The symbolism with respect to Jesus on a crucifix as with Isaac on a crucifix was just too, too spot on. There were a little bits in here that just carried so much weight with the facial expressions, the violence, just to see Green Lantern taking that power beam and wiping out a $9 million plane in one panel, just as Green Arrow looks on calmly. It was like a movie moment that brought down the house, just as akin to like back in the 80s, where there would be an explosion in the background and people would walk away from them without turning their back and overhead. It was a marvelous, marvelous issue. For what it's worth, this issue also contained a Golden Age reprint story called The Impossible Mr. Paradox, way back from Green Lantern number 38. An interesting story about a radio show that gets canceled because it's just not interesting enough and they can't find a sponsor. Now, does the person who created the radio show take revenge or is it someone else? This was a story that left you guessing and it was a really clever one. A little bit more trivia, this would be the last and final issue of Green Lantern, but only for a few years. It would be revived a little bit later, but not with... Neil Adams is the artist, but with a newcomer by the name of Mike Grell. In the interim, the mm. feature of Green Lantern would go over as a backup in Flash Comics for several issues. And one note before I move on, a correction that I had. Now, in the last podcast, not once, but twice that Ramona Frayden worked on the DC title Superheroes. But what I should have said was Super Friends, Super Friends. I presume most people knew what I meant, but still, I sincerely regret the error. And that was Chris's Comics Corner. Chris's Comics Corner. Now, last week, Sven Gulli showed The Invisible Man's Revenge. I think it's only the second time that he showed it uh, since um, 2011. Uh, what would you think about the movie, Chris? Thanks, Prof. I'd like to give a shout out to the people in social media that commented. There were some nice people on Sven Gulli with some great, great comments. I like that some of the people also put a poster reproduction of this movie out there. Oh, and I thought, yeah. you know what? Don't necessarily fall asleep on some of these movie posters from the horror movies back in the day. I thought they were really, really good. And I thought this was a great poster. Now, let me get to the movie. Wow. Uh, Invisible Man movies. Are most of these Invisible Man movies stories about revenge? So <laughs> it seems so. I don't know. Uh, I think the cast really, really did a good job elevating the script for what it was. And I think this was worth a watch. I'd give it a letter grade of a C, maybe a marginal C plus if I was generous. Mm. Uh, Professor, I, I think we talked a little bit before the recording. You didn't get to see too much of this one, right? No, I didn't. Uh, we had a little house issue, a little furnace heating problem um, during the movie, and uh, I was a little distracted. But um, I kind of liked what I saw of it. I found uh, I was dropping in about every 10 or 15 minutes, sometimes missing a lot of the movie, and had no idea what was going on. So um looks like a classic old movie, <laughs> you know, and I love them, so I can't really comment on how much I liked it. I think I've seen it before. So, um, so I didn't, I, I couldn't remember it last week, but I think, uh, I think I know this movie. I agree with your maybe C. I would give it a C from what I saw and from what I recall. But next week, Sven showing 13 Ghosts, the old one with, uh, from, by William Castle. Uh, he's, this will be, I think, the third time, according to Greg Litchfield's uh, Sven Gulli Movie Tracker. I uh, showed it in uh, 2018 and 2019. So this, I think, will be the third time. And I think I've only seen it these two times it was on Sven Gulli. Do you like that movie, Chris, 13 Ghosts? I, I'm a sucker pretty much for all William Castle stuff. I think the yeah. guy's a showman, and I like what he puts together. Now, they don't necessarily all hit a home run. They're not all the best movies ever made, but I think they, they are made with heart and a lot of love for filmmaking. So for that, I applaud it and I'll be totally down for it. Professor, how about you? Yeah, I agree. I think William Castle is, it sounds funny and it sounds like I'm talking down to him, but he makes absolutely competent horror movies. And that is unusual for a lot of horror movies. You know, they make sense. They have characters, they have relationships and there's a plot and people generally 
behave like you'd expect them in a situation like that, at least in a horror movie. Um, I particularly like 13 Ghosts. Um, I, I like the family. I think the family dynamic is really cool. I like the dad who is kind of a bumbling, you know, not good with money and, you know, always in debt and the mom and the kids, you know, the son and the daughter. I think it's just a really good family relationship. And it's not scary, but it's cool. The, the horror stuff is cool. So I can't wait for 13 Ghosts, one of my favorites. But now later in March, and I wanted to thank MacRox for pointing this one out. Later in March, Spenguli is showing Dracula 74, also known as Dan Curtis's Dracula or Jack Palance as Dracula, which I've seen a couple of times, including in 1974, but uh, also um, more recently. And I, I think there's a lot to criticize about the movie, but I happen to love it. I think Jack Palance, while he might not be everyone's idea of Dracula, I think for me, he is probably the second best Dracula, um, second to only to Lugosi. Um, I think he's a great Dracula. So thanks, Mac Rocks, for pointing that out. And I can't wait to see it. Have you seen uh, that version of Dracula, Chris? Boy, Prof, I know I think I've seen scenes of it, but not the entire movie itself, but I'm also more familiar when I posted like listings from the old TV guide yeah. from the Detroit News, where I know I've <laughs> reproduced the, the panel or the listing where the film was shown on television numerous yeah. times. So I'll have to double check my feed on that. Yeah, I remember seeing it in 74 and I was just blown away by it. And it was my first, I think it was my first uh, time seeing Jack Palance in anything. And I was just like, man, this guy's scary. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, there are issues with the movie. I think it's the way it's shot is weird. And there's a couple of pl plot problems, but that's all. But, you know, oh, and by the way, you know that guy? You know, the guy that was in that show. He's that guy, you know. He's that guy in that show. That guy in that show. Oh, right. Hey, Professor, this <laughs> week's That Guy in That Show was suggested by Mac Rocks. It's Ted Knight. Professor, yes. can you please enlighten myself and the rest of the listeners about the talented Ted Knight? You bet. Uh, this is going to be a tough one to say. Uh, you may be able to do this better than I can. Ted Knight was born Taduts Wadlislaw Kanopa. Kanopka. Perfect. That sounds Never good heard. to me. Yeah. All right. Well done. Well done. <laughs> Thanks. On December 7th, 1923, in Terryville, Connecticut. Now, Terryville is in Litchfield County, Connecticut, and his parents were Polish-American. He left high school to enter the army for World War II and earned five battle stars in Europe, which I had no idea about. He started acting in Hartford. I lived in Connecticut for a long time, so I know all about these places. He started acting in Hartford, and he was a puppeteer and ventriloquist. He got on a children's show in Providence and worked there for five years till 55. And then he went to Hartford where he hosted the early show that showed movies and had kids content. He was kind of the host, I guess. He also did radio, but dropped it all to go to Hollywood. Glad he did. He was in, he was only in a couple of movies and a lot of times he wasn't even credited Two Time, two movies uh, I think would be interesting. He was in Psycho, 1960. He played at the end, he played the cop guarding Ma Bates's room, which is really, you know, uh, Anthony Perkins wrapped up in a blanket at the end of the movie. And he's the cop guarding the door. And in the movie MASH, he has some offstage, offscreen dialogue. So that that's, you know, he was in a couple of movies, but his he was a mainly a TV guy. He was in a ton of TV stuff. He was in The Young Marrieds, How to Marry a Millionaire, Highway Patrol, Lassie, The Donna Reed Show, Peter Gunn, Death Valley Days, Sea Hunt, The Asphalt Jungle, Dr. Kildare, The Untouchables, The Virginian, Mikhail's Navy. I don't remember him on Mikhail's Navy. I'd like to catch that. Gunsmoke, Bonanza, Gomer Pyle, Combat. The Fugitive, the FBI, he was in Get Smart. I don't remember him on Get Smart, and I would love to see it. Uh, he was in The Invaders. I, you probably remember that. The Wild Wild West. <clears throat> he was in something called The Mary Tyler Moore, Moore Show. Where he played Ted Baxter, and I think we're going to come back to that, my guess is. He was in The Love Boat and Too Close for Comfort. He was in a lot of anthology TV. He was in the GE uh, General Electric Theater, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, One Step Beyond, which is don't 
Don't uh, forget about One Step Beyond. It was a great kind of Twilight Zone-y show. He was in The Twilight Zone, the uh, episode the, the Lonely. He was in The Outer Limits, episode The Invisible Enemy. And he was in The Craft Suspense Theater. Ted Knight passed on August 26th, 1986, at the age of 62. Way, way too young in Los Angeles, California, USA. Now, a couple of things. You can't talk about Ted Knight without talking about the Mary Tyler Moore show and uh, the movie Caddyshack that he was in. So in Mary Tyler Moore, uh, there are a couple of things that I remember him from. And one is he had a girlfriend who the group found out used to be a prostitute, but Ted had no idea. So they were telling her, well, you know, Ted's a good guy, blah, blah, blah. If you tell him, he should be able to, you know, he should deal with it. And what happens happens. And he, you've got to tell him, you've got to tell him. So she whispers into his ear, the secret. And he was like, oh, who cares? What do I care? Oh, you're so silly that I would be, you know, worried about that. What do I care that you worked in a warehouse? Uh, and then she re-whispers in his ear, and he's like, oh. <laughs> uh, sadly, he did not keep going out with her. Um, so there you go. Now, there was the other time in Mary Tyler Moore, he had a bit where he, you know, somebody was depressed, and he was like, yeah, you shouldn't get depressed. Most people, you know, they spend their day getting up out of bed in the morning, eat breakfast, go to work. And he just went through this boring day of people. But that's not how you should live. You should get up in the morning, eat breakfast, go to work. And when Mary points out, he's right. It isn't what you do. It's how you do it. And Ted says, what do you mean? That's not what I meant. <laughs> and that is just Ted Knight all over. Uh, and of course, you cannot forget the Beloved, I don't know if beloved is the right word, but in Caddyshack, he played Judge Smales, and he was the perfect foil for all the other comedic actors. Chevy Chase, um, Brian, uh, Brian Doyle Murray, all those other guys, they played off of uh, Ted Knight. And in a way, Ted Knight played the straight guy, and he was the funniest straight guy ever. Um, I really feel like uh, I would have loved to see a lot more by Ted Knight. He passed way, way too young. And he was really one of the very great actors, personalities, comedians of all time in television history. Chris, what are some of your memories about Ted Knight? Thanks, Professor. When I first came at Ted Knight, it was like when he was the narrator of the Super Friends cartoon of all uh, things. Uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He did a lot of that. Did a lot of those. And, you know, with the classic line, meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice, <laughs> just the way he, he said that so authoritative and he, he played it straight and he was real serious, you know, and when he did the opening narration of the Super Friends cartoon, it was just mm. when you heard that voice and you heard it resonate and he just said it so authoritatively, it just like... Wow, yeah. I, 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 I'm watching this here, and they, they're, they're taking it pretty cool. And even my parents would deduce that that voice was Ted Knight, and they go, well, you know who's saying that, don't you? And I said, no. What's well, the guy who's Ted Baxter on the Mary Tyler Moore show? And I said, nah, what? no way. You know, <laughs> mind blown as a kid, you know, they could they could associate and match the voice with that. And for me, it, it took me... It took me a little while to put... to make that connection, because I couldn't think that was said by that guy from that show, you know, the Mary mm -hmm. Tyler Moore show. I couldn't, I couldn't picture it. But then as I got a little older, I said, yeah, yeah, that's him. I that's Andrew. Yeah, that, yeah. Absolutely him. Meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice, you know, that, <laughs> yeah, just the way he did it. Uh, Professor, the Mary Tyler Moore show, uh, one of the <sighs> classics of all of television. Yep. And I thought it was really, really creatively done. And it had such a great, great cast of comedic talent and everyone really held their own. And it was a marvelous, marvelous show. I, I really thought it was kind of cool, though, when you saw Ted Baxter <laughs> reading the news, he did it in such delivery and he, he would you, he would just read something, but not being conscious of what he said <laughs> and just with the respect to how, <laughs> how he did that. And he would always read copy standing up, which I thought, why didn't they put this guy behind a desk when they said what they had to say? But it was really, really cool. And as the Mary Tyler Moore show progressed and all the characters went through nuances and changes and they grew and they developed, how fitting of an end is this for a TV mm. series? They figure out that, you know what, our new show isn't working. So 
we're going to fire everybody, but we're going to keep the least competent guy who is Ted <laughs> and we're going to fire everybody else. I thought that was just, could, could, could it not win in any, any other way with respect to that? Uh, we also talked about a show called uh, Too Close for Comfort, which originally was on ABC. And on that show, he played Henry Rush, who was a comic strip artist who drew a comic strip called The Cosmic Cow. And that show, believe it or not, lasted six seasons. My gosh, it ran for 129 episodes. It started on ABC and it went to syndication. Now, in that one, like I said, he was a comic strip artist uh, called Henry Rush. He had two daughters that also lived in there that was set in San Francisco. And they also, he was a foil to uh, Jim J. Bullock's character called Monroe. Monroe, you know, and yeah, it's really, really, that, just the way yeah. he would always say that. I think one of the nuances of the character was that he always wore sweatshirts from various colleges mm -hmm. and universities, and it got to be sort of a thing that he would do. Uh, the sitcom, I think, was basically known for general generational humor. You know, uh, mm -hmm. he was sort of like a staunch parent. You know, he, he would certainly forbid he, one of his adult daughters you know, having a guy over for the night and everything with respect to that. Uh, Professor, you mentioned Caddyshack, and there were just so many marvelous lines in that movie with respect to what he did in the delivery of the lines. And just like when he's dedicating the boat. And he's standing on the boat so proud and just, just and he says, it's easy to grin when your ship comes in and you've got the stark market beat. But the man worthwhile is the man who can smile when his shorts are too tight in the seat. <laughs> Immediately without missing a beat, he says, Spalding, get your foot off the boat. You know, just chastising his nephew. Uh, just so, so funny with respect to all those lines that he did. Um uh, Telling his nephew when he goes into the snack bar, I want a hamburger, I want a cheeseburger, I want a hot dog. And he says, you'll get nothing unlike it. You know, just, <laughs> just so many things. And when when uh, the golf shot is about to be made, he goes, well, we're waiting. He just <laughs> he had so many nuances to the part. Marvelous, marvelous stuff. Uh, great, great, talented comedic actor. And somebody dug up something, too, where he did like these laxative and uh, mag milk of magnesia commercials. Really? Fun, fun stuff. Good, good stuff. Yeah. Professor, great, great stuff. Yeah, I agree. Ted Baxter. I mean, what a great character. Um, <laughs> so funny and a great choice for that guy in that show. So this week's that guy in that show is Ted Knight. He's that guy, you know, he's that guy in that show, that guy in that show. And now it's time to check out our frenzy faves. Okay, today our Frenzy Faves is a Twilight episode. We're going to look at the episode 22. We're looking at season two, episode 17, 22. This was directed by Jack Smite, teleplayed by Rod Sterling, based on the anecdote, famous ghost stories by Bennett Cerf. The original air date was February 10th, 1961. Our cast was Barbara Nichols as Liz Powell, Jonathan Harris as the Doctor, Fred Wayne mm -hmm. as Barney... Cameroner. We had Arlene Sachs as the nurse in the morgue and the stewardess. Mary Adams as the day nurse. Norma Connolly as the night nurse. Wesley Law as the airline agent. And Angus Duncan as the ticket clerk. All right. The episode opens with a woman, Liz Powell. She wakes up in a bed to a ticking clock. She's what in what turns out to be a hospital room. And she reaches to the bedside table to get a glass of water. But it smashes to the floor. She hears footsteps in the hall outside and gets up and follows. She sees a nurse go down an elevator to the basement. She goes to the elevator and follows her. In the basement, she sees the doors to the morgue swinging. The morgue is room 22. A nurse comes out and says, We have room for one more, honey. Liz screams and runs away. It turns out this is only a dream, but one that Liz has repeatedly had night after night. She's in the hospital for overwork and fatigue, and she's having this dream now and believes it to be more than a dream and is very upset. Her agent, who has kind of belatedly visited her in the hospital, doesn't believe her dream, nor does her doctor with the weird laugh. And it's the same actor that plays Dr. Smith in Lost in Space, Jonathan Harris. Though the doctor does wonder how she knows the morgue is in room 22. Now, she does get the rest she needs, and she's released from the hospital and heads to the airport to get a plane to Miami Beach to do a show. As she checks in, they tell her that the flight is about to take off. Yeah, go out. It's out there right now. It's flight 22. 
Liz is shocked. 22 is the room number of the morgue. And she's even more shocked when she bumps into another passenger who drops a vase that breaks on the floor, just like the glass in her dream. She goes out to the tarmac to get on the plane, and as she approaches the door, she goes up the uh, the stairs to the plane. It turns out the stewardess is the same woman from her dream that led her into the morgue and says, there's room for one more, honey. She runs off screaming and doesn't board the plane, which explodes on takeoff. <laughs> Great Twilight Zone episode here. Uh, I, I was. It took me a little while to sync up with the story. Um, the opening with Liz in the hospital after the initial dream, explaining what was going on. I found that to be a little janky, a little like, like is she in the hospital because of the dream, or is she ex- in the hospital because she's exhausted and then started to have the dream? And if she had the dream before she was in the hospital. You know, if you're having a dream that upsets you that's set in a hospital, why would you go to a hospital? So I I had a couple, I had a minute or two of a little confusion as I kind of caught up to this. Um, You know, a a few questions that weren't really resolved, but were resolved later in the story. And uh, also I found, you know, that Dr. Smith had a very weird off-putting laugh on him. But those are just quibbles and getting them out of the way. Barbara Nichols is fantastic in this. She is, uh, I never, I don't know, I'm I'm not a, I don't know a lot of these older actors and actresses, but boy, oh boy, can this, can she act? You can see that she's playing a tough woman. She's a stripper, basically. She calls herself a dancer, but she's a stripper. And she's used to slugging life out on her own, despite all the male idiots that are constantly annoying her and hitting on her and trying to manipulate her. She gets it. She's world-weary. She understands the game and everybody's role in it. And it's just too tired anymore to fight it. I love Liz as a character. Now, Another thing I really liked about this story is that it would have been very easy to have the doctor placating her. Oh, yes, honey. Oh, that sounds like a scary dream, honey, blah, blah, blah. No, he's listening to her. He's thinking. He's really trying to help her. He doesn't believe her that her dream is like a prophecy, but he's definitely, he he's respecting her. He respects her. And I like that. I'd almost like to see a post credit scene where Liz has lunch with the doctor and tells him what happened at the airport. That's what I was thinking after this was all over, that I wanted to see that scene. This is a great episode, definitely sparked my imagination, and I'm just totally digging these these Twilight Zone episodes. Uh, A a couple of things I wanted to point out, uh, and Chris, maybe you might... Uh, comment on this or folks uh, in the audience might. I don't think people get on planes from the tarmac anymore. I haven't flown in a little while, um, probably uh, pre-pandemic. But, you know, back in the old days, it was you'd get up on these um, walkways, you know, on these um, steps to the plane. But now it's pretty much all jetways. So I think that's the new normal now for people. And as another kind of FYI, I've seen Twilight Zone episodes, of course. And just so folks know what we're doing here. There's like 150 Twilight Zone episodes, more or less, five seasons of it. And I'm not really a big, big TV watcher of old stuff. I've seen plenty of them. But because of this segment and some of these, Chris, that you uh, recommended, I've got the Blu-ray of this complete series. And I'm digging doing these Twilight Zone episodes because I I think we'll we'll do a couple of Twilight Zone episodes, you know, (laughs) for a while while, for the frenzy phase. I'm just I'm really loving it. Chris, what are some of your thoughts about 22. Thanks, Prof. We'll go over to the car tarmac comment. Uh, I think there are a couple of things at play here to consider. I, th- With respect to an airport in a major metropolitan area, I certainly think you would have the jetway. Mm. If you were in a smaller rural town, maybe less likely to have a tarmac. And I'm talking about mm. uh, uh, smaller cities and smaller states, you know, where they do have a quote unquote airport which Mm -hmm. basically would take you to a larger city where you would fly more commercially to Mm -hmm. to make a connecting flight. You know, say if I was in a small town in Wisconsin, I would take a plane to maybe to the Twin Cities, which could could then get me to LA or Atlanta or what have you. So I think there's that. Plus, I also think there's the element of if there was a jetway, I don't know necessarily would the scene have been more effective. So maybe Mm -hmm. she was in a larger city and it might just be from the sense that... uh, just from a, a way to tell this story, we will shoot it this way as opposed to a jet way. So perhaps, yeah. you know, but I digress. Yeah. Um, 
some trivia, get that out of the way. Barbara Nichols, who was the lead, would uh, appear as Maid Marilyn in a two-parter episode of Batman with Art Carney Ooh. as the villain, the Archer. Uh, okay. Ar- she was credited as Arlene Sachs, but AKA she's also known as Arlene Martell. She was the woman who said, room for one more, honey. Uh, she is also known to Star Trek fans from the episode Amok Time, where she played mm. Dupring, who was, for a moment, betrothed to Spock. <laughs> she also acted with Leonard Nimoy previously in an episode of The Rebel, and these two would later work again together in an episode of Mission Impossible, so that's pretty cool. Arlene Martel would also appear in a few episodes of The Monkees, and she also played Tiger, a French spy operative, on a few episodes of Hogan's Heroes. I thought Jonathan Harris, as you mentioned, as the Doctor, was really great in this. He's best known as, yeah, as you said, Professor Dr. Smith in Lost in Space. He also appeared in another Twilight episode, uh, called The Silence. And I think that's a great episode mm-hmm. that we'll probably look at again at some point. I think Harris is marvelous because he's caring, he's swarmy, and he's a mm-hmm. bit creepy all at the same mm-hmm. time. And I think mm-hmm. that's really, really tough to pull off. And I really like the way he's effective here. And just the way he says deadpanly, room for one more, honey, when he recounts the dream, just as pitch perfect when he says yeah. this. Uh, I think there are also little bits too that are really, really well done. And this is sort of with the cast that is uncredited. I think some of our cast that are in the background characters are really good in this. The woman who gets her vase broken at the airport lobby, she just kind of looks at her, looks at the vase, kind of just shrugs it off. And I mean, who would do that? You'd think she'd put more of a fuss saying, hey, you broke the vase, let's do this. But she just kind of dumbfoundedly stands there and just has this one moment where she has to shrug and move away. And I think she just does her little two seconds really effectively. Um, when the plane crashes and bursts into an explosion, you, you, you also see next to Nichols, an airplane employee. It's a guy and he mouths the words, oh my God, when the, when the plane mm. explodes. And just the way he looks at it and the way he says it was really, really done. Uh, a few other notes. This episode was done on videotape and it wasn't filmed oh, like right. the majority of the Twilight episodes were. I think this was for a budget saving production cost to say on production cost mm. uh some of these were videotaped still that said i thought it was really really effectively done it still didn't necessarily translate to you lose anything with respect to the story or with the way it was filmed it was really really effectively mm. done the nuances of the show itself i think there you can watch this particular episode 22 which i think some people in fandom who are fans of the series mistakenly title room for one more honey Mm. And they don't necessarily equate that. To, uh, oh, do, do you mean the episode 22? 22? What do you mean? Oh, the room for the morgue. Oh, now I get it. So I think some people mistakenly, some fans of our, the series kind of mistakenly do mm. that. That's another thing I had in my notes. I also had to, just with respect to the beats, you can watch uh, episode 22. And there are so many nuances that you can pick up on. The clicking, the glass breaking, all of these things, all of these elements happen at the airport as well, where you necessarily think, you know, you, you, a lot of people are just hung up on the room for one more honey and being mm-hmm. creepily done there. And by the way, Martel is so effective just the way he says that. And she's got these perfect moon saucer eyes that really look creepy when she <laughs> delivers the line. And she heard us, she's got this half smirk on her face, which really looks menacing and off putting, which is really, really perfect for a nightmare. So that subtle, subtle acting, but really hitting it and just really being effective doing that mm. is, is a chef's kiss with how this is done with the whole entire cast here. Um, professor, you mentioned too, with respect to like, uh, Nichols character is, is a stripper, but they, they're, they're, all the men are carefully correcting. Oh, dancer. They, 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 yeah, they don't yeah. necessarily use that line. She's a dancer, you know, mm. and, and, but <laughs> they, they are very, they, they want to put in front of that. Um, Nichols character also talks as if, you know, she's world weary. She's been around. She's, 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 she's got this tough exterior. She reminds me a little bit of, of the way she talks a little bit like uh, Arlene Sorkin as Harley Quinn a little bit there. Mm. Not quite mm. uh, New York Bronxy a little bit there, but just, just enough as to, you know. Uh, she's a dame. Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And I really, really like that. Um, that's a fantastic episode. And I think you, there are so many subtle things that you can, get and pick up on with repeat viewings. And I I think it's a marvelous, marvelous episode. Yeah. One reason that it might have been done on videotape was, wasn't there a special effect of the uh, the plane blowing up? And I wonder if it was easier to do it on videotape. I certainly would have, I certainly would think so. Yes. And as you were talking about uh, the the steps up to the plane, the last place I did that was in the mid nineties and would have been in a flight from Hartford to toronto Mm, wow okay and i remember getting up to it and even then you know the steps up to the side of the plane was a 
rare thing. And I remember when we were, I, it was a business trip and the, the whole crew of us that were going up there, we walked out and they put us on the tarmac and most of the people faces dropped when they saw that they had to climb up the stairs to get oh, I'm not going up there. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> people are funny. Yeah. I would think like like a Learjet, people who travel a lot by Learjet would probably still have to get on a tarmac. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think yeah, smaller yeah, ones. Yeah. 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 Well, that was great. So this episode 22 is one of our frenzy faves. Just another Professor, we've got some thanks to the people, but I will let you take the floor as to what you put on social media, because I cannot do this justice as you can. Professor, please take the floor. There is a couple of songs, so I'm going to I'm going to see if I can take this. OK. All right. So my post is to the tune of Helter Skelter. When I start buying comics, I do not want to waste all my dough. So I stop and I look down to check out my notes that I took when I heard the Best of Friends is show. Yeah, well done. Applause, applause. I could have <laughs> not you. done that as justice as well as you did. So thanks. With that, we'll move That's on to our roll call of comments that we got first. But not <laughs> Let's get that out of the way. Uh, we heard from uh, at Cat Victory who said, hey, if you all want to see a really episode of Hawaii Five-O, check out Season 7, Episode 11. Welcome to our branch office. It's corny, mm. silly, and unbelievable, but, but very entertaining. It has one double cross after another. It stars Frank Gorshin. Give it a listen to week's Ooh. Professor Frenzy show as well. So a couple of comments from Cat Church Victory. It's the nice. official podcast of Willoughby. <laughs> <laughs> very good. I was thinking if we ever did a, um, uh, a Twilight Zone uh, podcast, we could call it, uh, uh, we could pretend we were the radio station of Willoughby and call it W-L-O-B, Willoughby. I totally dig it. Thank you so much. And yes, Cat Church, I am familiar with this episode that you referred to. In this one, um, Frank Gorshin is is a partner of another con man, and they ba they basically have a shakedown operation where they make a fake 5 office and they hire lookalike actors to portray the 5 staff and, to, oh. and to basically, you know, shake them down and embezzle them and they pay protection money and they can't, they, they're dumbfounded. Now, it's weird because they get a, a, a fake for uh, McGarrett and they get a fake for Chin, but Danny played by James MacArthur, he, he's got a dual role. They couldn't find a fake Danny, I guess, mm -hmm. or the, he basically d does his hair another way and it's really, really good. I thought Gorshin was really good in the episode and I think he just didn't have a lot to work with. It would have been nice to see him stretch the role, but I concur with you, Cat Victory. It's a great episode. Welcome to our branch office. It's phenomenal. I concur. We'll put it on the list. Oh, absolutely. I and I enjoy that one. I, I am very familiar with it. We also heard from our friend at Greg Litchfield, who said, do you don't want me to read comics? I'm listening to the Professor Frenzy show because of economics. <laughs> tell me, tell me how to afford all those books. Well, I may be a comics lover, but I ain't no Daddy Warbucks. And he nice put a nice picture <laughs> of the cast of Little Orphan Annie, and we really appreciate wow. that. We heard from our friend Mac Rocks, uh, excellent podcast, uh, Classic Corner. He does remember the Man Monster issue. It was very strange to find the structure as the politician what the heck i agree mm. with chris i recall i was old enough to buy those silver age comics speaking of which my son bought me this for christmas which has tons of pictures and historical info in the series and he showed this nice uh book of the uh, tash and marvel books in a slip case which was very very impressive Ooh. and i'm very very envious and he says, I am thrilled and honored that you liked his selection of Dudley Dickerson uh, is that guy. In fact, he appeared on a Stooges short last night, right before Spangooly. And I thought that yeah. was marvelous. I caught that. That was I really, really that. good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and he said, I like that you saw him in so many things. I applaud Hollywood execs and everyone for breaking down the racial walls. As this was a man who was a marvelously talented actor. Macross continues. Yes, I got a hold of the Twilight Zone segments. Uh, Serling was a genius Uh with thriller and gore without the thriller and without gore, which would even yeah. uh, not even fly, you know, on TV back then. Um, we discussed the episode and the escape to more idyllic times, go and study and read some of those early morning world while the world was sleeping. He also put a picture of these amazing Spider-Man reprints that were instance from the Sunday paper. That was many, many years ago. I remember those were uh, in my local area as well. And I've got to pick those up. Uh, he thought the man made monster movie gets a C 
for the letter grade mm-hmm. could have been so much better too much lag yeah and he says that he never saw invisible man's revenge either you know my tell for the rest of the month seems accurate prof we got uh, dracula with the dan curtis one so thank you so much and yeah. he put a nice gif of same bad time same bad channel we also had a great little conversation where we looked at a pick from uh, the batman green hornet episode crossover mm-hmm. that was really really good so thank you for bringing that to the attention and from daryl app and he forwarded that to us so thank you very very much mac rocks Okay, Uh, Professor, uh, Robin's got a comment. Uh, Can you take a stab at Robin's comment since you're in great vocal voice range today? Yeah, I don't know exactly how to do it, so I'm going to make it up, but this is to the tune of Ticket to Ride. Poor Gart's got a witchy wife. He longs for a quiet, better life. The train's speeding up, and he's going to jump. Elysium, Nirvana, heaven. Awaits and guard finally finds heaven gate. How's that? <laughs> Nicely done. <laughs> well done. Thank you so much, Robin. We appreciate that. We heard from uh, at Siddharth Philip. Uh, there's going to be a lot on this post. <laughs> yes, we agree. Yeah. There is. Uh, and then we have uh, Randy. Um, now he's got a he's got one to a tune of "Beautiful Day" by Michael Bublé. Professor, handing the baton off to you. All right, let's give it a try. I don't know why I gotta have my comics today. I don't wanna change the mood. Baby, it's fine. We're just good friends to be sure. Listen, Professor Friends' show and have a beautiful day. Thank you. Thank Prof. Thank you, Randy. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get there. And well, Randy also said on Soundtrack Alley, the whole buying comics, the smell of the page and the whiff of the shop. Bring it to me, will you? Take what you could find, read till you lose your mind, enjoy what you have in comics. Listen, the Professor Frenzy Show, it's the only way. Thank you so much. And Clinton, nice. Clinton, I like you. This is nice. You said, I got no <laughs> lyrics you, to fit this tune, so I'll just say, listen to the show. Clinton, nothing wrong with that, my friend. We appreciate that. Absolutely. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And you're over on Twitter at Coffee Comics BLG. Uh, heard from our friend Happy Archaeology at MM4NG. Love Deadly, recognizable face. Great show, guys. Sven yeah. needs to play alligator people. I totally agree. Thank you very much. I love that movie. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And with that, we'll move on to our roll call of likes and retreats at Joey Galvez 1984. Please check out all of the uh, fun uh, things that he's got on Kickstarter. Let me get that right, Joey. Uh, you mm. are really upping the game with the tiers and everything. With respect to that, please get on board. Check out at Joey Galvez 1984. We heard from at Anita Kearney, 65. Thank you so much, right. Anita. Uh, let's see here. Moving right along, we also heard from our friend at Cat Victory. Thank you for the great polls. So much, Cat Church at Cat Victory. Oh, so at Laredo Arc 2018. Thank you so much. Uh, Zaz and Zabi at T-Bear 10 at Newbon Michael. Thank you so much. Our mascot of the show, Robin at Robin 031 Robin. We heard from the Long Box of Darkness at Dark Long Box. Thank you so much. We also heard from Mad Shelley Films. We heard from our friend David at Quinley 21. Our buddy at Chris Lighting 7. We heard from our friend Bill. He's got a podcast called The Bat Pod. You can find them at the bat underscore pod. Congratulations to Bill. Oh, thank you. Yes. Good for the reminder. Yes. Yeah, we got married. Oh, best wishes to you, Bill. Thank you so much. We heard from our friend at the Telltale Mind. We heard from our friend Two Sleeps at Two Sleeps Music. Now, we're recording this right before his concert. So just to get the plugs out of the way, I want to tell you listeners, he brought down the house when he did an awesome rendition of Harvest Moon by Neil Young, which was requested by Robin. And boy, you talk about a moment where it just left the crowd emotionally stunned with how marvelous the performance was. It was brilliant. It was something to see and watch. So if you want to see a concert for free, might I suggest you go on at Twitch TV, 3.30 Eastern, 2.30 Central on Sunday afternoons. You will get a fantastic concert of fantastic material, some original, some covers, and covers a lot of genres. Two Sleeps at Two Sleeps Music and Don't Fall Asleep on the nice, affordable Patreon. Nice. We also heard from our friend at Rick Strimbles, does a great podcast. We heard from our friend uh, Doc Strange at Billy the Underscore Licious, does a few podcasts. Um, Magazines of Monsters is the feed, also does a world on fire. I want to give a shout out, though, because on the past podcast you had on Karen, you talked about the movie Shockways with John Carradine, Peter Cushing, and Brooke Adams brought back some great memories. I want to give a shout out to uh, Gary, local friend who hit me up to that movie. Who And by, I hate the word serendipity, but I just happened to watch it recently based on his <laughs> suggestion. And then Doc Strange, you had Karen on to talk about it. Fantastic movie. And who knew there was just such a slew of Nazi zombie movies? Marvelous, marvelous stuff there. But awesome cast and uh, definitely worth a watch. 
And I also want to give awesome. props to you and Martin talking about an issue of Brave and Bold with some great Nick Cardi artwork that had the Bad Squad from back in the day. A marvelous, marvelous podcast, my friend. Thank you so much for your support. We heard from our friend Kirk at Big Five Army. Uh, moving right along, we heard from our friend at Iowa's Joe, who is one half of a podcast called The 21st Century Boys that he does with his son at 21STC and Boys. Our friend at Greg Litchfield, who's been a comic book reader and collector for 52 years, reads comics and reviews them on a concise scale. Randy, you can find at Randall Andrews One with the sketches. His podcast is Soundtrack Alley, where he looks to see how music enhances the cinematic experiences, is at Soundtrack Alley. Our friend Ed is at Teal Productions. Dance Fever, The Lords of Order, which is a Dr. Fate podcast, the Mighty Thorcast that he does with Terry, and the Superman Superstar with Stephen or else, and Newsprint Commando also talking about Wonder Woman comics from the late silver, early bronze age of Wonder Woman. Also heard from our friend at Sue Schweiner. We heard from our friend Dallin. And Dallin's at Dallin B. Jared Albrich, the yard sale artist. Check out his marvelous, marvelous work at Yard Sale Artists. We heard from our friend Jeff at Sympathy for the Devil. We heard from our friend Brett at Coughlin Brett. Mac Rocks at Mac Rocks 56. Then we also had our friend Clinton at Coffee Comics BLG. Clinton does a podcast called Coffee and Comics. And about that podcast, he looks at a comic and about the time he takes down a cup of coffee. You can also find him over on Fan Film Fridays of the Longbox Crusade feed. Thank you so much, Clinton. Over on Facebook, we heard from our friends Chris Hamby, Bill Beer, Clint Robeson. Over on Blue Sky, we heard from our friend Lava Hog. That would be Dave and the Selling Out Show. Over on Threads, we heard from Calvino Phillips, the Rad Adventures Network from Darren and Ruth. And we also heard from Tracker Talk. If I overlooked you, my sincerest and deepest apologies. Please let me know on social media at X slash Twitter at B2 and Bad Books, or let the professor himself know at Professor Frenzy. We sincerely appreciate your support. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Professor Frenzy Show. You can find our podcast if you do an iTunes search for the Professor Frenzy Show. You can listen to the show on Twitter and find me on Twitter at Professor Frenzy and Chris at BTO and Bat Books. Hey, we're on Facebook over the Professor Frenzy Show page. We're on Instagram at Professor Frenzy. We're now also on Amazon Music and we are now also on YouTube. Just visit youtube.com slash Professor Frenzy, all one word. We are now also on TikTok, so go to Professor Frenzy 2 to see our videos. If you have an Android phone, the Professor Frenzy show is part of the free network. Just swipe right on your homepage and look in the art section of the podcast list. Whatever device you use, you can subscribe to our podcast feed by doing an iTunes search for Professor Frenzy. Thank you for listening to the Professor Frenzy show. Let us know on Twitter what you think about our show, and please help us get the word out to people that might like these kinds of comics. Thanks to everyone for listening. We look forward to chatting more about comics next week. And please remember, pick up your poll. Professor Frenzy. Professor Frenzy. All original content of the Professor Frenzy Show is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution No Derivatives 3.0 Unported License. Professor Frenzy. You are on the Frenzy Feed.